This podcast is made possible by your support and your donations. Thank you. And by the purchase of my book called Everyday Buddhism, Real Life Buddhist Teachings and Practices for Real Change. I will post an affiliate link to the book on Amazon in the show notes. And if you've already read it, please take a minute to rate and review and also consider purchasing it again for a friend or family member as a gift. Also, as you probably already know, I have a Substack where I post reflections and also host a spin-off podcast, Words from My Teachers, featuring readings from the books written by and about my teachers from the Bright Dawn Center of Oneness Buddhism and the Kabose Dharma Legacy. The lineage from which the Bright Dawn teachings derived is unique in the Dharma sphere, and its teachings are what I built my podcast and virtual Sangha approach on. As a special incentive to listeners of this Everyday Buddhism podcast, I'm offering a special promo code for a subscription to my Substack posts and the words from my teacher's podcast. Just click on the link in the show notes by March 31st, 2024, that's March 31st, 2024, to receive 20% off the subscription for one year. Welcome to Everyday Buddhism, making every day better by applying the proven tools found in Buddhist concepts. Welcome to episode 106 of Everyday Buddhism, Making Every Day Better. In this episode, I talk with Steve Kanji Rule about his book, Appalachian Zen, Journeys in Search of True Home from the American Heartland to the Buddha Dharma, which is the 2023 Gold Prize winner for memoirs in the Nautilus Book Awards. Reverend Steve Kanji Rule is an innovative Zen Buddhist minister ordained in the Zen Peacemaker Order and is now teaching independently and instructing Zen students through his Touch the Earth Cyber Sangha. Kanji received his Master of Divinity degree from Harvard University and is a Buddhist chaplain at Deerfield Academy, a Buddhist advisor at Yale University and a faculty member of the Shogaku Zen Institute. Kanji has been a guest speaker or workshop facilitator at Harvard Center for World Religions, Yale Divinity School, the International Conference on Socially Engaged Buddhism, and the Omega Institute. In addition to Appalachian Zen, he is the author of Enlightened Contemporaries, Francis, Dogen, and Rumi, Three Great Mystics of the 13th Century, and Why They Matter Today, and has recently finished writing a new book about his personal experience of spirituality and wellness called The Whole Earth is Medicine, Science, Zen, and Healing Body and Mind in a Journey Through Cancer. He has also published two volumes of poems, The Constant Yes of Things, and Paintings of Rice Cakes Satisfy Hunger. I will put a link to his website and social media links where you can find out more about him, his ministry, his writing, and diverse interests. And of course, I will also put a link to his books in the show notes on my website. In his book, Appalachian Zen, Kanji takes us on a 30-year journey through his search to find his, quote, true home, unquote, in lilting and lyrical prose and poems that move the story from Appalachia through academia, constantly asking, what is home? What is this? What is life? What is death? What is real? The questions Buddhism never answers, but continue to ask. In our conversation, we talked about, among other things, childhood memories, the search for self and the search for losing the self, 
being a foolish being and Shin Buddhism, the contrast between Western and Eastern philosophical and spiritual worldviews, mystical Christianity and the similarity to the direct experience of the sacred in Buddhism, Buddhist lay ministers as compared to Buddhist monastics, priests, and the guru model, and Kanji's traditional teaching of be clear, be kind, and be present. A quick note about the audio quality. Due to issues with the stability of our internet connection, we switched to talking with Kanji via a phone connection at about 19 minutes into the episode. This explains the change in audio from Kanji. It is only a change, but the quality of Kanji's audio is easy to listen to. I hope you will enjoy listening to this conversation as much as I enjoyed talking with Kanji. The conversation starts now. Hello, Kanji, and welcome to the Everyday Buddhism Podcast. Thank you for joining me. Oh, thank you, Wendy. Thanks so much. I'm delighted to be here with you. Um, I shared your bio uh, in the episode introduction, um, but I know after journeying through your book, and I'm using that word uh, purposely, that despite your significant accomplishments and activities that a bio um, summarizes, it really stands as a hollow shell <laughs> to the to who you are that the that reader gets to know when they read your memoir Appalachian Zen. Mm, this you. is where I usually have my guests talk more about themselves, like filling in the bio blanks, you know. Um, mm -hmm. But honestly, Kanji, I can't do that with you. Um, and that's because after reading your memoir, it's like just, it just, we need more than just who are you? How did you come to Zen? Blah, blah, blah. You know what I'm saying? It just, there's so much more there. So if it's okay with you, I'll begin with a description of your book from a couple of blurbs and then from my reaction as my own blurb and an initial question to start your start the conversation. Does that sound good? Sounds your... great. Let's do it. Okay. And by the way, this isn't a this isn't a dig. Um this is a <laughs> this makes you a rise to the cream of the crop sort of thing. <laughs> Oh, I'm very touched by that. Thank you. <laughs> so, okay, here's a here's a review of your book by, uh, from Lion's Roar. Um, Steve Kanji Rule relays his aching grim story of homesickness for a place or thing or state of mind that for years he couldn't seem to locate. It certainly wasn't homesickness for his actual hometown, a place of desperation, cruelty, violence, and crushing poverty. Rule's journey takes the reader through the hollowed texts of ancient and contemporary literature, finally leading this poor Appalachian kid whose ancestors were indentured servants and factory workers to Zen Buddhism. Sentence for sentence, Rule's language is brilliant and lyrical, and his unflinching story is an important commentary on American Zen not as a hobby or spiritual consolation among upper-class practitioners, but as real and ancient medicine, eminently available to anyone. And then from Bruce Watson, author of Light, A Radiant History from the Creation to the Quantum Age and editor of the, uh, the, journal, uh, the online journal, The Attic, Quote, it's a long, strange trip from Appalachia to the Zen world of Japan, but poet Zen minister Steve Kanji Rule made the journey and now brings back the pictures. Appalachian Zen soars on Rule's eloquent and profound word pictures from his life and life studies. This book will sweep you through a troubled life, turning transcendent through escape, searching, and finally commitment. Take the trip. I'll jump in here to try to summarize my experience with your book. Watson's choice of the word strange trip to describe your life journey and his urging to others to take the trip is spot on from my experience with your memoir. You know, I read a lot of books for this podcast and don't always get to read books off my podcast schedule. 
Your memoir took me deep into your life and my life, taking me away from the thought of planning a podcast episode and definitely on a trip. It's the kind of book I'd like to take a few months or maybe a year <laughs> reflecting on with my journal, and I just might. So I accompanied you on your search for home, for understanding, for the self and the death of the self. But more amazingly, I went on my own search for the same things in my life, along with you as a sort of call response to your writing through my own margin notes. Your book is beautiful, lilting and lyrical, full of poetry and the prose and poems that move the story ahead. And it's brilliant, I have to say. I learned to be ready with the dictionary open on the phone. I like to think of myself as someone who has a great vocabulary, but you made me feel sort of ignorant. <laughs> <laughs> your, bo your book is in a, a journey from Appalachia through academia, constantly asking what is home? What is this? What is life? What is death? What is real? These are the questions Buddhism never answers, but always encourages more of the questions. So your book is lots of life, lots of death, old age, sickness, and death, as we say. And finally, no birth, no death, no self. So now, Kanji, my question is this, why? Why did you write a memoir, which as a Zen Buddhist seems a bit paradoxical, right? Did mm, you, absolutely. Did, did, absolutely. You, did you write it for you? Did you write it to exercise demons? Or did you write it knowing it would be a book? Take it away. Answer. <laughs> uh, well, Wendy, first of all, I just want to say thank you for those accolades. I'm very honored, very touched. And to answer your question, um, there were several reasons for writing the book, and it is paradoxical as a Zen Buddhist to be writing a memoir. And I touch on that in the book at one point, but I, I'm happy to elaborate on, on it here today. The process of writing the book took about 30 years, and it was off and on. I was engaged in working full-time jobs that kept me very busy and i was using the income to support the writing of the book and there were also various life issues that occurred people in my family had died and so on um so those were things that i was dealing with unexpectedly while writing the book and um then also i was sometimes uh I was sometimes involved in academic work, in teaching, and I was working on other writing projects as well. So it took about 30 years. And during that period of three decades of writing the book, not only was the book con constantly developing, but my reasons for writing it were evolving. So one of the initial reasons for writing it was that I'm currently living in a very affluent and progressive area of Western Massachusetts. And I began to realize quite early that among my numerous friends, nobody was familiar with the type of circumstances that I grew up in. And um, it was a completely different world to them. And so I thought it would be useful and instructive to share with people the experience of growing up during that time uh, from the early and through the late 60s through the present time in central Appalachia in a very working class environment and to make that accessible for people who uh, not only are unfamiliar with it, but often find it completely bewildering. So that was one of the incentives. Another one was to find a way, hopefully, to make my particular experience of growing up in that region of uh, central Appalachia not only particular to me, but universally resonant and evoking themes that everybody experiences in terms of love and loss and trauma and forgiveness. Because if the book were only about me, I mean, who cares? Uh, it really has to be about <laughs> it really has to be about a broader human experience. So that's what I was trying to evoke. And 
it is true that there's uh, something of a paradox in a Zen Buddhist practitioner writing a memoir, <laughs> and um, and I do I do touch on that in passing in the book itself, but I'm glad you brought it forward in the question because it's worth elaborating on a little bit more. Um, so I was quite conscious of that. I was conscious of the paradox of being in a spiritual practice that emphasizes uh, the cultivation of, of no self and the diminishing of clinging or attachment to the small ego self and then writing this this book that requires not only a tremendous amount of ego in the in the basic <laughs> presumption of you know why would somebody want to spend time reading this um but also uh because it involves so much uh self introspection and trying to um come to terms with situations that were very very personal so the way the way i endeavored to bridge that was to work from the conviction that to be an artist of any kind is to be as honest as possible particularly as a writer yeah so to be candid about my experiences hopefully would supplant that paradox that that you're pointing to so skillfully of a zen buddhist practitioner writing um, about his own experiences over a period of three decades yeah you know I, and and i sense that um as a as a journal writer all my life i sense that you know these were just uh, in some whether or not you started out that way and, and you said you did in some ways you started out that way because of your awareness of of gee, you were like a, a, a square peg in a round hole kind of thing. I mean, nobody understood what it would be like to grow up in Appalachia or be that poor. Um, but yet, even though I didn't, um, you know, I grew up in a small farm town in Ohio, so and I wasn't all that thrilled to be there either. But um, I wasn't poor. Um, I wasn't we weren't rich, but we were pretty much middle class. But the thing is, is what I found in there, just as you so eloquently pointed out, the stuff that you brought out about that experience is stuff that everybody lived through. If you lived through those times of the 50s, 60s, you know, mm -hmm. and people who didn't might under not understand what the heck you're talking about but you know the things you named were things that were as relevant to me as as to you i imagine so that so that it, it was wonderful that there was so much universality in a memoir right mm -hmm. <laughs> which is kind of hard to do so you did it uh, very skillfully i'm glad to hear that thank you um, but there's much, you know, there's so much more I wanted to talk to you about, uh, way more than we have time for on this podcast episode. Um, as we chatted a bit before the recording, we are contemporaries, um, one year difference in age, by the way, I'm the eldest, but <laughs> only by a few months, probably. <laughs> so we live through many of the same sort of cultural experiences like we were I was just taught referring to from the 50s 60s and 70s and beyond you know the Beatles early television Vietnam Kent State by the way that's my home area I mean, it was the next town over from me mm -hmm. um assassinations of political figures racial riots and on and on and on which I think um sort of branded us in a way you know even if we if we didn't have an Appalachian background we had that cultural similarity mm -hmm. absolutely and and the two of us then came to Buddhism learning from first generation Buddhist teachers right, right? you know we didn't right. we didn't we didn't have the the luxury of opening up a tab on our laptop and googling something you know like uh What's Vajrayana, you know? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely right. So, like I said, I don't share your Appalachian roots or the poverty, um, but I really shared exactly what you said. Is like I felt like I was always running away from my small town 
Ohio farm town rural roots to something else of which I didn't know what it was, but it was something that I knew I was destined for, whatever that was. And so you put that in the terms of um, the true home. That is a phrase used in Buddhism, not just Zen Buddhism, but other Buddhism. Mm -hmm. Um, Can you talk more about sort of the search for your true home and sort of the Buddhist search for a true home? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, Eventually they did come to coincide for me, but uh, the search for the true home for me uh, before I embarked on Zen practice was what you just described very well. It was uh, feeling a destiny to arrive to uh, another place where I would feel a sense of belonging outside of my family, because I was very fortunate to have a loving, accepting family, which made all the difference. But to find a place where I I felt I had kindred spirits and where I could really be fulfilled. And that was something that was a powerful aspiration, especially throughout my adolescence, and feeling really alienated, feeling very much adrift uh, throughout my teenage years, in part because of the culture of violence that that I encountered there, which was traumatic. And I realized later I came out of my high school experience. And for for your listeners who haven't haven't read the book, what I'm describing here is um, you you pointed to the cultural events uh, that were taking place at that time during the late 60s and early 70s. And I was very much as a teenager part of the counterculture. We um, we didn't have much of that where I lived. I was in some cases the sole representative, or my brother, my younger brother, and I. And um, and the reaction to that was was quite harsh. It was quite severe. There was a lot of um, physical assault, and it was it was pretty scary. Um, so I came out of that experience essentially with post-traumatic stress. And um, so looking for the home was a place not only of fulfillment for me, but also finding a place of safety and security where I could really, really feel that I had arrived and then could start to blossom in the ways that I felt destined to do. Um, there was an inner compulsion to uh, experience a world that was not being given to me uh, where I was where I was growing up, except for the sort of oblique visions of it that were given to me by my high school mentor, uh, uh, Bruce Bechtel, who is a central figure in the book Fun Home that some of your listeners may know. Um, so looking for that particular kind of true home, it was largely an art, more of an artistic vision uh, rather than a spiritual, uh, although the two, uh, the two do have some overlap. So when I first encountered Zen Buddhism in a formal official sense, because in a certain way, I think I had been practicing something related to Zen starting quite early in life without even realizing it, uh, I would have long periods of just being quiet and observant and alert without any thoughts passing through my mind. I didn't know that it was related in some way to what we might call meditation. But years later, when I came to a Zendo for the first time, then I did have a sense of homecoming And it's a sense of homecoming that has never left me every time I step into a Zendo, which doesn't imply that I'm some kind of Zen chauvinist either, because I think (laughs) that people can have all kinds of uh, spiritual paths that are beautiful and valuable um, and completely authentic. So... uh, Coming into a Zendo, there was a sense of homecoming, but in a deeper sense, that true home is our original Buddha nature. And that's something that we're born with, and we have it 
internally with us all the time. And so wherever we are, under whatever circumstances, we can always have access to it. And that was really the most critical discovery was to realize that the true home is inside each of us and it's always there. Yeah, that, that, that's, that's perfect. And, and you get that, you know, I should explain to, I don't think we, we sort of explained this at the beginning, but it's pretty hard to explain sort of the format of your book, right? It, mm -hmm. it kind of weaves in and out of um, advancing a storyline or a narration between memories and, and, um, and poetry and descript de descriptions. And so, um, you know, you get that sense that you're constantly um, discovering and rediscovering what that means, that home mm. part means, you know what I mean? It's like, um, yeah. I, I, I right away, I identified with your search at the beginning, but it's, it's, you kept cut, you would come to it in a different way and then you would lose it and then you would come to it in a different way. And the way you described it, and, and I guess unless you have read the book, you don't quite maybe understand how this goes with you, you with the way you like. I've I've used this phrase before uh, in describing other people's writing, and 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 your book reads like a river, right? Mm. Um, Thank you. Well, I'm I'm glad to hear that it has that flow, that it has that kind of coherent flow, and it does move with the experience that's unfolding over those those 30 years I described. So uh, again, readers who uh, or listeners who haven't uh, read the book would not be aware yet, for example, that uh, in the course of that flow of that river, uh, two people very close to me, um, a former girlfriend who remained a, a, my best friend, and then my younger sister both committed suicide. So there's that uh, particular flow of that river to encounter and you know, that keeps moving, keeps moving through that in this continual search for that true home. Where is the true home in the midst of these kinds of tragedies, these kind of um, challenges and adversities, as well as the joys that we all encounter in our lives? Exactly. And, and it's it's like you, you, it brings up another uh, point I wanted to say, you know, you wrote, um, this is a quote from your book. The authentic journey always cuts its trail inward. A journey to find unique truths not only requires seeking the great jewel of the soul, as mystics call it, you must also confront the stench of everything that shames you and that scares you. And, you know, mm -hmm. you you pointed to the, the, the loss through suicide of your um friend and your and your sister and actually and your teacher as well and, That's and, right. and and that is brilliant and it's also very buddhist it's what i think those of us on the buddhist path for decades discover through our own unique experience you know when people first mm -hmm. come to buddhism oftentimes or maybe all the time they come seeking, I think, escape, uh, seeking some sort of uh, magic running away from what scares them, what makes them angry, or what makes them crazy. But in the right. end, it's about really living it fully. You know, yep. uh, mm -hmm. and, you, and you quoted Alice Walker's writing saying, quote, my experience is that almost everyone I've met who has turned to Buddha did so because they suffered the end of a love affair. They have lost right. someone they loved. Very often people turn to Buddha because they have been carried so deeply into their suffering by the loss of a loved one that without major help, they fear they will never recover. You know, that speaks to it. I dove, I dove deep into the Buddhist practice and path and study after my mother's sudden death in 1997 in my 40s. And I think you Oh, were. I see yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I always, it was always there kind of from high school and so forth, but it, mm -hmm. I, you know, then life happened and then I dove, you know, then her sudden death sort of forced me and to like, I, I had to figure out sort of 
sort of what was going on and how I was going to go the rest of my life like this. We weren't even that close, but it was that that actually confused me. So mm -hmm. it, it rings true in my personal experience, but also in the experience of so many others I've met on the path, students, um, uh, 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 you know, colleagues, people on the path that I've practiced with. You know, there's so much here the need to escape the pain, yet the escape is paradoxically in the complete embrace of it, right? Can That's you talk right. more That's about right. that? Yeah, well, you just said it very well. I think the embrace of the pain is is the crucial factor and not to try to run away from it because, as you just said so well, the real escape, ultimately, the liberation from it is by the direct engagement. And so to really go into those dark places, the places that scare you, the places that are very painful, and try to explore those as honestly as possible. And so when I talk about my particular experience having universal resonance, that's what I'm hoping for. And I also, through my own journey, have come to realize most recently, and this doesn't necessarily uh, suffuse the particular book of Appalachian Zen, but um, I know your experience has uh, a lot of influence from Pure Land Buddhism, from Shin Buddhism. And so right. also there's an element not only of um, self-effort, but also surrender, surrendering uh, the self to an other power. And I've learned a lot from that too in what we're talking about here of uh, navigating the pain and coming through it in a way that is conducive to wholeness. Yeah, that that's true. And I wanted to touch on that again, and I'll probably leave that for a little later because I wanted to say something else too, but that's that's absolutely true. It's like, but I don't, you know, it, it, you know Pure Land sort of like the... Uh, I think it's the Appalachian Zen cousin of Buddhism, right? Nobody, <laughs> nobody <laughs> knows about it, right? And they, and they sort of think it's a cheap knockoff of Christianity or something. It's mm. very hard to explain to people. Um, you know, I come from a tradition that is um, um, uh, not a, it, it's purposely not aligned with any one tradition, but comes from a Mahayana, uh, a, a Japanese Mahayana Buddhist sort of mix of Zen and Shin um, mm -hmm. uh, from, my, uh, from my lineage in the Bright Dawn Center of Oneness Buddhism. But um, to explain sort of that Shin path or that Pure Land practice, it really does you know, you even mentioned it in the book about the salvific vow and so forth. And, and mm -hmm. it's like, and that is the traditional approach. However, that isn't all of Shin. You know, that right. really is not all of Shin practice because there is so much more to it than even though we don't necessarily emphasize sitting or meditation, there's this deep listening that is emphasized in Shin Buddhism. That means it's listening to life around us, right? It's, mm -hmm. it's mm -hmm. listening mm -hmm. to what life has to offer and, and so forth. And we, you know, we were taught, we were trained in our ministry program to find the Dharma in every minute of our life. And then one of our trainings was to write mini Dharma talks um, mm. every week uh, that were called Dharma glimpses. The point mm. is, is did we listen enough to glimpse the Dharma in our everyday life? So mm. that it de-emphasized the escape part and emphasize the interconnection or the turning to others, right? Mm, right. Right, right. That's beautiful. That's really beautiful. The other thing that was um, useful to me as I understood uh, Shin or Pure Land Buddhism was um, when I was in divinity school, I took a course uh, that highly emphasized Shinran. In fact, we yes. worked from the collected works of Shinran, and I found it 
tremendously powerful and inspiring. And in particular, and I think this does come through the Appalachian Zen book, the sense of um, being a foolish being who continually makes a mistake. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> and, you know, that's part of what I try to convey honestly in the Appalachian Zen book, too. You know, I'm not trying to make myself look good, not trying to make myself look, <laughs> quote, spiritual, unquote, but trying to be as honest as possible about, about here's this, you know, bumbling fool trying to <laughs> right. figure out where is the true home. Right. Yeah, yeah, that's it. And that is that that's the beauty of the Shin Path, too. It's actually sort of why I left. I spent decades in Tibetan Buddhism and I mm-hmm. came to to the Bright Dawn Center of Oneness Buddhism and Shin Buddhism because just like Shinran, I felt like a failure in Tibetan Buddhism. Um, yeah. I felt like I was never accomplishing anything. I was clearly never going to get enlightened. I was like halfway through my Noondra, which is called the beginner practice, but it's certainly not beginner. It's like a hundred thousand prostrations, a hundred thousand guru offerings, a hundred thousand. It just, it's, it's ludicrous. Um, Oh, it's so intense. So intense. Yeah. I, 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 it's ludicrous for me. It's kind of like the Bodhisattva vow. It just seems impossible. Right. Um, Mm -hmm. but, but it's not, you know, I get it now. I look back at it and I see what happened there, but, but it's like, it's all one Buddhism and it all has many forms, which you point to, but it's like that, that foolish being stuff. It's, you know, unless we're willing to show our bumbles, you know, our bumbling path, um, Mm -hmm. we, it's very hard to accept our own foolish beingness if we don't see that other people are sharing their own foolish beingness. <laughs> you know That's what I mean? Right. That's right. <clears throat> and conversely, as you know, I mean, it's it's hard to accept other people's, you know, <laughs> That's right. flaws and foolish beingness if we don't embrace our own. So, yeah, I, I find that really inspiring um, in Shinran's work and the example of his life and and what he did to try to work through that. Yeah. Um, and at some point we're going to have to talk about that again, because y- your other book where you, you compare, um, I forget the name of the book. You know what I'm talking about. The, uh, the Enlightened Contemporaries book? Yeah, Enlightened Contemporaries. You know, Shinran was a contemporary of that, those people. That's right. Yeah, yeah. contemporary. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. It's like I kept thinking, you should have put Shinran in there. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, there's a lot I could have done in retrospect with that book. I know it's true. I wish I had. <laughs> um, I'm going to sort of, de- you know, go off this path a little bit, and then we'll go b- back on it again. But um, mm-hmm. you wrote, and and this is just a fun little area that I wanted to bring up with you. Is you wrote how you are mystified when people confessed how little they recall of their childhood. Um, Mm -hmm. But you recall so much about your childhood and in such detail, it Mm. does seem an artistic retelling to me as you Mm. quoted your high school teacher's inscription on the page of the poem Wasteland by T.S. Eliot, um, past just preserved as memories of vanished time recovered artistically. So let me ask you, Kanji, does this explain your detailed lyrical memories? I mean, they're unbelievably detailed. I have pretty good childhood recall, but yours is unbelievable. (laughs) Oh, well, I do have a, I do have a very vivid memory. And, um, When I was younger, I had a a photographic memory. That's kind of dulled a a little bit with age. But, um, you know, I have talked to people who say they recall very little of their childhoods, and it's not necessarily because they're in denial or they're they're blocking out from childhood trauma. It's simply that the memories don't seem to to have persisted. And so it strikes me that that my memories of childhood are so... So detailed. Um, I mean, I can sit down and I could draw. 
I could draw a map from memory of the interior of the house that we lived in when I was five years old, room by room, and it, the whole thing. It's so, so clear to me. Um, so a lot of the, uh, the recovery of the past, and in, incidentally, I'm rereading Proust now after 50 years. I, <laughs> I read Remembrance of Things Past when I was 19. I'm reading it again. And so this whole theme of the recovery of the past through memory um, is very alive for me right now as I'm reading that. But the experience of bringing the past into the present um, is one that feels very alive for me and very natural. And, um, and I guess I feel fortunate to be able to remember as much as I do and be able to bring it into a book that might make it alive for other people too. Oh, yeah. I mean, it's like, uh, um, you know, and because you're a poet, you know, your memories have these, you, you know, the detail of your memories have just all these, these beautiful descriptions and, and, and that can like bring us all back. Right. Uh, and which mm -hmm. is wonderful is, you know, like all you're walking through the woods, it's the nature is, is just such a persistent theme in, in your memories. And, um, and and I have that similar memory because I was from a rural area, so I did a lot of woods walking too. And you know, back in our day, we were allowed to wander around. Nobody ever thought somebody was going to kidnap us or anything. So we exactly. spent we spent a lot of time walking in the woods or sort of being gone for, for like a whole day or a night or whatever. Um, well, exactly. There was that sense of total freedom. Yeah, that's how I grew up as well. And it didn't imply that, you know, my parents didn't care about me or where I was, but there was a, a sense of, of trust. And so I was free to roam and explore at a very young age. And the memories are very sensual for that reason, as you're pointing out. And so I think it's the sensuality of memory that really helps to evoke it, them for other people. Um, if you yeah. can bring that, uh, you know, the the lusciousness of that experience to bear on the page, then people will respond. And yes, absolutely. And I did. I I can't tell you how many times in my margin notes would say it. Oh yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> or, 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 and I would say out loud, Oh yes, I did that too. Exactly. <laughs> so so well, I, I'm so, glad, <laughs> I'm so glad to hear that. I'm so glad to hear that. You know, the other the other thing, too, about that, just to say as an aside, is there was also a practical reason from sheer writerly craft to try to keep the sentences as alive as possible. And it was out of respect for the fact that people have so many obligations and so many so much busyness in their lives that if I'm going to ask them to stay with me on the page, I have to make it compelling for them. Um, so it was out of also respect for the reader uh, and not to be presumptuous as a writer and to really, you know, make it as engaging as I could. Yeah, that's absolutely true. I mean, like I said at the beginning, at the very beginning of this episode is, uh, um, you know, I have to read a lot of books for the podcast, but if I could take like, you know, months or a year with your book and it, my journal, that would be a wonderful practice because <laughs> mm. it would probably um, mine a bunch of memories that kind of are right there for me, but I don't ever play with them because of my busyness. You know, that's, that's, mm. that's interesting. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, it I, is. It is. Well, I just, just to say quickly, it is interesting, and so maybe if the book does encourage people to do precisely that, to you know, to take a few moments to reflect and to try to regain access to whatever memories might be there, whatever sensory experience is calling to them, then you know, that's another way of fulfillment for the book. Well, actually, you even kind of end the book that way. I it, it's a, I, I remember the I, I highlighted this sentence, how living between contrasting worlds, he seeks the Dharma and finds his way home, uh, talking about the stories. And it says, now you tell yours because our stories are important. And it, it's yeah. like, I started telling mine in the margin notes. So 
<laughs> so I was already so doing that. It's wonderful. <laughs> oh, good, good. I'm so glad. So now I wanted to bring something up and it goes kind of circles back to something we were already talking about. Um, you wrote a lot about at near the end of the book, um, primarily because it does go chronologically, you know, uh, the first part of the book is, is your childhood and teen years and so forth. But um, near the end, when you were, you were in your um, uh, MD, when your master of divinity program and, and when you were really, you know, past your studies of, um, or, you know, already had your, I think you had your uh, lay ministry ordination at that point, but you wrote a lot about the contrast between the West and the East, which always fascinates me too. Um, the mm -hmm. difference between sort of the, like you talked about, the Renaissance focus on the self and intellectual knowledge and the Eastern negation of the self and its labeling of uh, analytical reasoning as ignorance. So, to, mm -hmm. you know, the Buddha says that, you know, pretty much it, it is ignorance. Um mm -hmm. I know there is a lot to unpack here and I know I'm just hinting at it, but can you say more? <laughs> yeah. Um, so there is, there is a lot there. You're right. But essentially at that point, I was looking at uh, the contrast between the Western focus on, you know, the heroic self, the individual and the Asian, uh, particularly Asian Buddhist focus on uh, the experience of no self, which of course isn't exclusive to, to Buddhism. I think we find it in all of the mystical traditions, including right. in the Western mystical traditions, the abnegation of the small ego self in order to experience God, for example, um, is very much at the heart of, of mystical Christianity. So it's not exclusive to Buddhism, but I was interested in looking at, at that point in my own spiritual growth, looking at the contrast between what I had been raised to, to, to cultivate as, as a Westerner and what I was now being encouraged to experience directly in the Zen training. And um, I think I think Dogen in uh, the fascicle of his his masterwork, the Shobogenzo, where he is um, talking about uh, to experience the way is to experience the self, and to experience the self is to lose the self, and then to lose the self is to experience the ten thousand things of the universe. Right. Directly touches on this subject that yes. we're talking about here. Um, so the experience of the self is uh, very, very important. And uh, at the beginning of spiritual training, I think sometimes there's a misconception about that. There might be a sense of, well, it's necessary to annihilate the ego self because it's evil or something, <laughs> um, which is not the case at all. We need a very uh, well-developed, functioning, healthy non-neurotic ego self to navigate this this world of relative phenomena but we also as, as Dogen points out in the second part of this statement we need to learn how to set that small ego self aside so that we can experience the oneness of the you know the pure awareness of no separation um, and when we do that we experience the whole universe so that was how I've been able to bring the two together um, in a culture that tends to keep them separate. Yeah, and but you're right. I, I'm glad you brought out like m mystical Christianity because um, in my coming to spirituality, you know, I always bounce back and forth between Eastern religions, you know, like it's like, uh, you know, George Harrison, my sweet Lord, had a big effect on me. Um, mm -hmm. And the Beatles, you know, they were the first to talk about meditation, really, in a cultural, widely cultural 
accepted sort of way, at least for those youngers. Um, and then <laughs> um, it's like, I, 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 Christian mysticism really appealed to me and, and then also Buddhism. And it was a, it was a strange combination to me. And it took me a while to figure out why, the, what the parallel was. Right. And I think it was sort of understanding the self to like, is it, well, like what you said, it's Dogen's quote. It's like, you know, yeah. know the self and forget the self. And, and both of them do that. And I still return quite frequently to the writings of Christian mystics. I'm a special fan of Meister Eckhart and, uh, and uh, the desert fathers and mothers and, and so forth, because I think in our journey into Buddhism, there is a, it can be very mystical without, and I want to say that if, if people don't understand that, I think you and I are talking on the same page, but people don't understand that they, they think sort of like the woo-woo-ness of it, you know, <laughs> do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and of course, that's not what you and I are referring to at all. What we're referring to is the direct experience of the sacred without any intermediary. It's that direct right. experience sacred and that is what the mystical experience is regardless of the faith tradition regardless of the religion so uh, we do find that in mystical christianity we do find it with meister eckhart we do find it with the desert fathers and desert mothers uh, i think we find it in jesus himself at least according to what's been transmitted to us um and uh so that speaks very much to me as well. It's very compelling. And I feel a strong resonance with the mystical Christian tradition and with Jesus himself as a great bodhisattva, to put it into Buddhist terms. So um, it really it really feeds me as well as it feeds you. Yeah, it does. I have uh, maybe not an equal stack of books on both, but... <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. A significant amount. Yeah, me too. Yeah, I relate so, to that. So, um, now we're at. The, I'm going to get to another part here where we have a lot in common, and I think it speaks a lot to this as well. It kind of spins off of that. It's going to be a little long, but I think you're going to get it. I quote you. I quote other people, but okay. um, <laughs> you wrote about. You know, you talk about studying as a Buddhist minister in your Master of Divinity program, and you wrote about the visions for Buddhism or Buddhisms, as you questioned, in America in the 21st century. And and you wrote how we all work to, quote unquote, make our visions happen in all our all their freshness and vitality. Right. And, la and later you wrote something else related that spoke directly to me at, also as an ordained lay minister. You and I have that in common, different mm -hmm. traditions, but but the same sort of, I would say, sort of uh, in-between function to many people. Um, right. Quote, you said, I'm struggling toward defining this new thing, Buddhist ministry. In American Buddhism, in the early light of the 21st century, we have several types of clergy. And then you listed priests, chaplains, Dharma teachers, and then you wondered about how we need a new one. You said yeah. a Buddhist minister that could perform the duties of priest, chaplain, and Dharma teacher. Now this, and I'm, I'm sorry to go on this, but I think you'll understand why I'm doing this. Mm-hmm. This is exactly the mission and vision we were given by our teacher, Reverend Coyle Cabose, in his master plan that he gave us when we became lay ministers and senseis after oh, our wow. ordination. This is what he wrote, and it sounds exactly what you like you wrote. Quote, huh? our, our lay ministry program is designed to instill an attitude of one creative openness to encourage one's own spiritual growth. Two, humility and gratefulness stemming from a deep realization of the twin teachings of impermanence and interdependency. And three, joyful sharing with others and compassion for all. 
While there is profound respect for past teachers and established teachings, the source of final authority resides in one's own Buddha nature. The role or purpose of external traditions is to help one tap into and trust the dynamic unfolding of one's own karmic life path. Our main program motto is, or mantra is, keep going. This means that one's spirituality is always a work in progress. One is never a finished product. And mm -hmm. then he talks about how a good lay leader empowers the people because they empower the individual and that this development through Mahayana Buddhism was viewed as the movement toward the people in like in 13th century Japan, like religious leaders like Honan and Shinran and Nichiren were part of that movement. So That's it was right. A, right, a movement toward common people, farmers, merchants, working folks. Um, right. And so then he, add, he ends this way. And this is where the connection to what you wrote is so true, I think. Having said that above, what particular niche or contribution does our Bright Dawn Center's lay minister approach offer? Well, our approach is to continue this movement toward empowering the people. We endeavor to do this not by weakening the clergy, but by mm. eliminating the laity. That is, mm. the people can serve as their own clergy. This is the mm. philosophy behind what being a lay minister means. Mm. And, and oh. now you wrote at a later point, something echoing this completely. You said, if I see young members of the Yale Buddhist Sangha treating me with exaggerating de exaggerated deference or trying to hand their power over to me, I cut them off. I explained mm. to them, I'm a minister, but really I'm here as a mentor, as a trail guide on the path. What do I guide you toward? I guide you back toward yourself. Instead of being a master who dispenses answers to you, I dispense questions and guide you back to your own resources so that you can uncover the solutions yourself within. Why? Because you have original Buddha nature and the wisdom lies inside you. And later in that thread, you quote one of your favorite Zen mentors, who, by the way, is also mine, Charlotte Joko Beck, who wrote, what is needed is a guide who will make it clear to you that the authority in your life, your true teacher is you. And we practice to realize this you. There is only one true teacher. And what is that teacher? Life itself. So I apologize for the long quoting session. <laughs> But I oh, was <laughs> no apology necessary. No, thank you so much. That's fascinating. No, um, I agree with you, and uh, this is, I think, really important to bring forward. So thank you. And um, yeah, when we when we're leading people back to their own innate wisdom and compassion, we're leading them back to that true home that you and I were discussing earlier. Yeah, the true right. home that each person has inside, and. Um, and so I do see that as the ministerial function. You know, I, I really uh, disavow the entire guru model. Yeah. Uh, we we've seen we've seen what that leads to in many cases. It leads to abuses of power, abuses of sexuality, abuses of money, and it's again is is uh, was mentioned in what you quoted there. It leads to people giving their power away. And so completely disavowing the guru model and bringing it back to the individual person, which isn't to uh, encourage that person to aggrandize the ego. And say, oh, well, you know, <laughs> it's this kind of spiritual inflation of, well, I know everything and I'm completely enlightened. <laughs> Obviously, that's not what we're talking about. We're talking about empowering people to have that mystical experience that you and I were pointing to a few moments ago of directly experiencing the sacred without intermediary. And when that happens, it also fosters a very genuine humility. So it's just the opposite of a spiritual inflation. And uh, the clergy that, that, uh, that we were talking about a few minutes ago too, this, this movement that's taking place, I think, 
is also vitally important of complementing the existing clerical models of the priest or the chaplain or the Dharma teacher with this more inclusive role of the minister who also can provide the pastoral care and counseling that people are hungering for so that when they are encountering the breakup of a marriage or a child's illness or an illness of their own or economic problems, whatever it might be, they feel that they have a resource that can uh, be a good listener and respond with some wisdom of experience in leading the person back to seeing that they already have the answers themselves. Yeah, that that's so true. And I'm so glad you, you saw that connection. It was like you were expressing exactly what we, we were sort of, um, it was sent off to be ministers with, you know what I mean? It was like, you're, you're I, doing... I wish we would have had access to, to that. What you, what you were doing um, when we were designing the Buddhist ministry program at Harvard, that would have been great to, to know what you were doing. Yeah. Better... I, <laughs> you know, we're, we're sort of, we're, we're not all that well known, but since the bright dawn program started training lay ministers in the, in the tradition of our lineage, we have over a hundred lay ministers um, ordained throughout, well, throughout the world because there's a few outside of the country as well. So, mm. um, so, but it's 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 a you know it's a upstart kind of program, so it's not widely known. But uh, you know the Kaboses and Haya Akagarasu and so forth, they are known. Um, mm -hmm. from, because they were like, um, I, how shall we say they were Shin rebels, much like Shinran was a rebel to the Tendai. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. you know, right. Right, we're right. like Shin rebels. It's like, no, nah, <laughs> you know, it's, 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 it's not about Amida as savior. It's about, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's not the same thing. And, and that's sort of sort of what happened we they were split off and they were even like abandoned by the the shin the the traditional shin temples in 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 japan and mm. so it was it's a very interesting sort of background so yep sorry well, we couldn't have helped <laughs> yeah well yeah no that's fascinating i hadn't been aware of all those details but um but being a Shin rebel and pointing out that Amida, it's not about sa uh, being a savior. I think that's a, an important point. And, um, and I feel that I'm something of a Zen rebel too, <laughs> yes. uh, because I do question a lot, which is inherent in Zen practice. You should always be questioning everything. There should be a certain degree of skepticism, but I've come to the point at least right now. And of course things are always developing, but um, what I try to, to show people is that it's so simple. It's, sim it's just be clear, be kind, be present. That's all it is. And so there are certain teaching modalities to, to realize those. So to be clear uh, means to be clear about the nature of reality, not being deluded. And in my practice tradition, we use the koan training for that. And then being kind is simply being free of uh, clinging and attachment to, to selfishness. And so uh, the training modality for that is in the, the ethical precepts. And then being present is simply just being here without distraction. And the teaching modality for that is the meditation practice in my tradition. So um, that's all it is. So just be clear, be kind, be present. The rest of this enormous institutional edifice that's been constructed around that over the centuries, yes, it's very beautiful. Yes, I, I enjoy parts of it in terms of the aesthetic quality and the rigor and the tradition, all of that. But I don't think it's necessary anymore. Um, it's really so simple, just getting down to those three basic human qualities. Yes, and I like how you tied them into the 
to the grounding of uh, Buddhist teachings, right? I mean, it's it's they're they're not it's not taken taken away or taken from. It's 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 the natural sort of evolution or outgrowth, if you will, in in from the way I see it. Well, I'm so, glad to hear that. I'm glad to hear that because that's how it seems to me as well. Yeah, and I love that you, by the way, in your sense of um of of uh, being a Zen rebel. I like that we're both rebels. Um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> in your way of being a Zen rebel, I like how you quoted both uh, Charlotte Jacobeck and Tony Packer, and that you, you know, you 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 spend a summer, you know, a, a hour south of where I am right now at the Springwater. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, well, I got a lot from Tony. The way she pairs everything down to the the basic essentials and strips away the rest of it. That was really important to me, just as important as being in the traditional institutional setting at Zen Mountain Monastery, for example. They both were very valuable to me. But, you know, trying to to bring those together in a way that I can share with others now, um, it's really more toward getting getting to the pure heart, getting to the pure heart of it. And again, without this guru model, um, I'll be perfectly frank. I don't believe in Dharma transmission anymore. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, aside from the historical roots of it, which, which were strictly political, but the way it plays out now, you know, I alluded a few moments ago to these abuses of power, abuses of sexuality, abuses of money, and the Zen sphere. Those were all Dharma transmitted teachers. That's so, right. you know, yeah. that's, that's exactly- I, I have. No, I and I walked away from it personally. I walked away from the. I was in, you know, I was in line for it, and I walked away from it. Um, I didn't want it, at least in the lineage I was training in. And again, you know, I've known people who have been very awake, with open, compassionate hearts, loving people, knew nothing about Buddhism, yes, let right. alone nothing about Zen, and so what is really important is is as i say just be clear be kind be present and um and live and let live you know it's funny that uh, actually you know my teacher reverend coyle who just passed away a couple of years ago we just lost him a couple mm-hmm. of years ago um suddenly and he he um he we were starting to set up a succession plan since it was a sort of a beginning organization there were not a lot of structure not a lot of structure in place right um mm-hmm. so we we didn't have all that right we didn't have all those trappings we didn't have that and um people would ask him uh in, in talking about the succession planning which i was very much a part of since i was one of the first students i was part of the second lay ministry class so it mm. was ordained in 2009 um uh and he died a couple of years ago and a couple of years before that we started talking about succession planning and and he said people ask about dharma transmission who who's going to be my dharma heir because he had two sons but they weren't interested um mm. and so i think a lot of people i saw that jockeying about you know uh <laughs> getting in line for being the dharma heir um mm. and i remember him talking to me on the phone when we were talking about it privately he said i want you to know that i am not naming a dharma heir mm. i will mm. not do it it's it, because it's not what I've strived to teach you. Good I've, for him. Yeah, I I strive to teach that you are not to be your job here as you as you become ordained as senseis and lay ministers is not are not to be uh um not to be gurus, not to be teachers, not to be better teachers, but to be better students. Oh, I love that. I love so, that. So, um, so yeah, I was very, you know, it took a lot of people by surprise that, that someone wasn't named, um, but it made perfect sense. It did create a lot of organizational and structural, structural problems that we're still dealing yeah. with, but, but, uh, 
You know, Wendy, that's like Krishnamurti walking away from the whole thing in a way, isn't it? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Yeah. I hadn't thought of that. I hadn't yeah. thought of that. But, you know, I think maybe more like you're saying, you think it may be where it's going. I don't know if it's where it's going, but I do know people know that they don't want any more gurus anymore as they, you know, a lot of people yeah. know, although there are still people who stand in line to, you know, oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Well, we have learned that the hard way. And, you know, it's good to have our illusions drop away. I think when we encountered all this initially 30 years ago, 40 years ago, uh, we did have a lot of illusions about it. And um, so it's healthy, even though if it's painful to have those <laughs> illusions, you know, cast aside. But um, I don't know where my rebellious streak comes from. I mean, <laughs> you know, we talked about uh, you know, the late 60s, early 70s, you know, the counterculture. I was a hippie teenager. Then by the late, you know, mid late 70s, I was a punk rocker. And then I got into this weird, you know, Zen thing. And um, I don't know, I just, I have this, you know, independent streak. And uh, it leads me to uh, to question a lot, to question a lot, including um, what I what I encounter in Zen. But I think that's again, I think that's intrinsic to Zen practice, is to uh, you know not only have uh, the the great faith and the great persistence, but the great doubt. Yeah, that's always been one of my favorite sayings from Zen. Um, <laughs> definitely. Well, you know, we're we're at the end of our time. Um, we had some technical problems, which I will introduce at the beginning because I, you know, it's going to, the audio will change. So I, mm -hmm. I, I'm kind of lost at how long we've gone here, but I think we're at the end of our time. Um, it looks like it, yeah. I, I do want to end by sharing the beauty of your writing because I'm not sure we, you know, I'm not sure that's going to entice people <laughs> But by some of the stories we were told. So I could share dozens of quotes that captured me with their beauty, but I'm only going to share one that is a memory I sh also share with you of my childhood, but also a sad commentary on where we are now in the changing climate. My margin note from this quote that I'm going to share with you was, geez, gorgeous. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wow. This, <laughs> well, I mean it. Um, I'm a G's person. So anyway, this this is from a description of where you used to wander in the meadows and woods near a local cemetery, which I did the same thing. Uh, mm. So I was quite into this. So here's the quote. Night among those trees grew absolutely black. Fireflies appeared. Zillions of live embers, little rafts set ablaze, adrift on eddies of air. I sat on a log to observe them. It felt like reclining in God's easy chair, watching galaxies wink on and off. If my listeners want to go on a journey of discovery, of coming home, of finding and losing the self, all while reading beautiful writing like that, in that paragraph, get this book. <laughs> so I will put a link to your book and books and to your website in the show notes. But before we end, is there anything else you would like to mention, Kanji? No, Wendy, I think this is this has been a delightful conversation and, and you guided it so well and we covered so much. Um, I feel very complete. So thank you so very, very much. Thank you, Kanji. That's it for this episode. I hope you enjoyed the conversation with Steve Kanji Rule and we'll check out his book, Appalachian Zen, Journeys in Search of True Home from the American Heartland to the Buddha Dharma. Next up, as usual, some announcements. We recently began a new study of the Way of the Bodhisattva by Shante Deva with an additional commentary by Pema Chodron in her book, Becoming Bodhis Bodhisattvas, A Guide for Compassionate Action. It's a wonderful study, and if you'd like to join the Everyday Sangha, now is a great time to do it. It's a private donation-supported group that meets virtually via Zoom every other week on Saturday mornings at 10 a.m. U.S. Eastern Time. 
Our meetings consist of a service first, including traditional vow recitations and other invocation, some chanting, and a short meditation period. The service introduces a little more ritual and liturgy into the structure of our meeting, much like you would find at a non-virtual Buddhist temple, church, or sangha. The service includes a Dharma talk by one of the practice leaders or myself, a Dharma glimpse by one of our Sangha members possibly, and after the service we do open it up to a discussion of the current book study or of anything that was inspired by one of the Dharma talks. Consider joining the Sangha at this time to be a part of the new study practice and be a part of a warm and welcoming Sangha community. You can learn more about the Sangha by viewing the latest bonus YouTube podcast where me, Bradley Janayo Sensei, and Terry Zenkai Hoskin, who are our practice leaders, talk about what the Sangha is all about and what everyday Buddhism is all about. You can also support this podcast and the other activities of everyday Buddhism by becoming a community member. If you do, you will have access to all members-only podcasts, an education series, the Introduction to Buddhism course, the Buddhist Book Club, and a private group on a non-Facebook platform. If you don't follow me or Everyday Buddhism on any social media platforms we post in, you can go to the Everyday Buddhism website and join either the membership community or the Everyday Sangha. Just go to www.everyday-buddhism.com and click on either the tab that says Join Members Community or Join Everyday Sangha. Or you can join through Patreon at patreon.com slash everydaybuddhism. Links to joining the Everyday Sangha and the membership community are posted in the show notes. I do thank all of you who contribute. This podcast, the community, and the Sangha depend on your donations to continue to exist. I don't seek podcast sponsors, and I do not ask for financial commitments through paid podcast memberships. So my work and the costs needed to support what I do is entirely self-funded, except for your donations. Please consider a one-time or continuing donation through Patreon on my or on my website's donate tab. Or you could actually click on the coffee cup link on the website and buy me a cup of coffee. You can find the links in the show notes. And thanks, too, to all of you who write in with comments and questions. As the latest bonus member podcast illustrates, I read your emails and may even pick your question to feature in a bonus podcast. Another way you can help is to rate and review the podcast on your favorite podcast platform. It's important to share the podcast with others if you find it helpful in your life. And if you could, please take a moment to comment so people will know why you love everyday Buddhism. Okay, that's it for the announcements. So until next time, keep finding ways to make yours and everyone's days better. Mm -hmm.